been 10 years this October. Um, so I've been married for 10 years uh, this October, and my wife and I are really hoping for our 10-year anniversary to be able to go away together. Um, who knows if that will happen or not. We may still be in quarantine, but we have three children, ages four, three, and one. Um, so if th any, any parents out there, you can imagine what quarantine has been like for us in this last season. It's been, it's been pretty crazy, but um, this is a topic that I, that I need in my life. So let me um, share this, and we will... Uh, all right. Everybody see that? Is that good? Okay. Um, can I minimize this? Okay. So the ruthless elimination of hurry. And one of the things that I want to make clear about this is the goal and purpose of tonight is that we would learn to experience rest in the midst of our current world. And that's really important that the vision and heart behind this is that we would experience rest in the midst of our current world. Uh, we're not trying to create some utopian society that's different from, from what we live in, or I'm not trying to create some anti-technology like Amish world. I'm not advocating we all go back to like buggies and horses and get rid of phones and all forms of technology. What I believe is uh, that we can experience the rest that Jesus has for us, that we can ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives today in 2020 in quarantine and in social isolation that that can all take place um that, that can all take place today uh in, in the world that we're in and you know quarantine may be different for all of us for me it has not been restful like i said with small kids maybe for you it has been a really restful experience what i just want to remind you is the world will eventually begin to get back to normal and hurry is waiting at your doorstep, waiting to just come back into your life, waiting to all the things you were busy and hurrying, hurried with before. It's all waiting for you at the other end. So even if you don't feel extremely hurried right now, it's all coming once this thing opens up again and we get back to normal. So um, I mentioned this over the weekend, but I just want to, to uh, say it again for our time together here is what hurry means. Hurry is the result of a cluttered, unfocused life filled with too many tasks, obligations, and distractions. And uh, I can't see all of you, but give a little wave if, if any of that resonates with you. Like if you feel like, yep, I understand what hurry means. My, my life, it can feel cluttered. I feel unfocused. I feel like I have too many tasks too many obligations, too many distractions. I certainly struggle with this. And I have so many stories of it, but, but one that stands out is several months ago, I was on the couch and I was just, I was trying to do something on my phone and I was just getting bothered by my daughter. And I was like, okay, wait, wait, wait. And finally in her little beautiful three-year-old voice, she just said, daddy, can you put your phone down and talk to me? And it just like crushed me that I was so distracted and so hurried with the phone or the text or the email or whatever that my daughter was literally knocking on my shoulder, hoping to have my attention. And I think it's important for us to realize that hurry is certainly relevant in 2020, but hurry is not new to our age and our, our generation, our world. Hurry has been plaguing humanity for centuries. And there's, there's a chapter in the book that I just absolutely love, and I want to take us through very quickly, a brief history of hurry, because we can think that this is a modern problem. But the truth is, it goes back a long way, um, all the way back to two, uh, 200 BC. A Roman playwright writes down in his journal um, or in, in a writing that he is complaining about the sundial and complaining about the sundial and cursing the person who created a sundial because it was hacking his day into small portions and making him feel hurried. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of a sundial, I don't think of hurry. And yet the reality of time being divided up all the way back to 200 BC was making people feel hurried and anxious about time. In the sixth century, monks scheduled prayer seven times a, a day. And all of a sudden days become divided up by these regular timed things that are happening throughout the day. In the 13th century, more monks, they'll create a mechanical clock that will rally all of the monks. And now not only are we beginning to have hurry because of, of, of time, but now there's machines, there's technology involved helping to hurry people along. 1370, um, the first public clock in Cologne, Germany is created, and now time is a public thing as well. Artificial time has now been created. Somebody decided uh, a certain set of hours, and now publicly 
everybody's on the same schedule. Shortly after this, alarms will be attached to clocks. And now uh, uh, time has a way to interrupt us during our day. Lots of things change when this happens. One of them, we no longer sleep until our bodies are done resting. Now there's an alarm waiting to tell us when it's time to wake up. This is a massive shift in the human story. 1879, Thomas Edison invite, invents the light bulb. All of a sudden, nighttime can't stop us anymore because now with artificial light, we can stay awake late into the night uh, and, and do all the things that we weren't able to during the day. Once upon a time, when it got dark, you went to sleep. Now we have light bulbs. Before Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, humanity would sleep about 11 hours a night. We are now down to just under seven hours a night, meaning humans have lost four hours of sleep per night because of the invention of the light bulb. Inventions of the 20th century continue on to speed things along, and you can think of them too. Cars, microwaves, hair dryers, washing machines, uh, dishwashers, all of these really great devices that promise to save us time, but you know, like I do, never actually end up saving time because we just fill it with other stuff, right? All of this leads us to 2007, a year that historians will look back on as a year that the world changed forever and will never go back to how it was before because in 2007, anybody know what we got in 2007? We got the iPhone. We got the iPhone. Steve Jobs dropped the iPhone in 2007 and all of a sudden, all of the information of the entire world is available to us in our pocket. All of the distraction humanity can come up with is in our pocket. This thing is a dopamine dispenser on par with the hardest drugs that you can find out there. And it's completely legal and accessible and available to everybody. By this point now, studies show that our phones are never more than 18 inches away from us at any point during the day, including when we sleep. They are literally a new appendage to our body. The average user touches their smartphone 2,617 times a day. That's average. On the younger side, the more addicted generation, they will double that number, up over five to 6,000 touches of their phone a day. The average user spends more than two and a half hours on their phone. All of this distraction, all of this availability, all of the connectivity, it has all created the most hurried generation in history. And you know, the thing about the phone is we don't think we're on it a lot, but it's a lot like a slot machine. You guys know that slot machines make bring in more money than baseball and the film industry combined each year. But we don't realize it because it's a nickel at a time, a quarter at a time, a dollar at a time, and that's how it is with our phones. One quick text. Let me just do this message real quick. Hang on, I know we're about to eat dinner, but let me just do this thing. And we don't realize that hours and hours and hours of our life are lost to distraction that leads us to the hurry. And so Marvin, I think we want to throw the first poll up there. All right, so according to the definition of hurry, which again is the result of a cluttered, unfocused life filled with too many tasks, obligations, and distractions, how hurried do you typically feel? I love the live results. Leave it open for 10 more seconds yeah. or so. And, and you can answer this however you want to, uh, you know, whether you're viewing it as normal, regular life or quarantine, you know, it, it, maybe things have changed for you, but you can just, with your no current reality, that's totally fine. All right. So good, all right, it looks like we are primarily, well, 52% somewhat hurried, but can usually manage. Yeah, that, that's pretty normal. Um, on 42% never seem to have enough time to get everything done. I know, I can certainly relate to that. Um, to my cool as a cucumber brother, why don't you teach this one next time? And uh, to help I'm drowning, we are here for you and we will uh, continue to journey with this together. So thanks for sharing about that, guys. That's helpful to hear, all right. Uh, let's move on. Are you able to get that down, Marvin? I'm not able to move the poll off. Is it gone? Uh, I still see it. I took it off my screen. Can you X out of it and then? Um, 
you know, I can't, okay, here's, I'll just kind of do this. Okay. Is that good? Yep. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. So, um, iPhone technology. Okay. So ultimately what I think I want us to, to make clear though, is this is not just a conversation about hurry, but this is ultimately about discipleship. This conversation is not just about hurry. This is not a shaming conversation. This is not a looking down on anybody conversation. This is a conversation about discipleship, which is actually what all conversations of the church should be about. Uh, uh, everything that we do is about discipleship. And I, I want to kind of frame my view of discipleship uh, because there's a definition that I've got from John Mark Comer, the author of the book, that has been so helpful to me. And there's many ways that we could think about discipleship. But what I love is disciples at the time of Jesus their goals, their purposes, they remain the same of us today. A disciple is somebody who reorients their lives, meaning they are willing to change something about their life, re redo their, 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 you know, what, how, how, what they see as important, uh, what their values are, their priority list. They will reorient their lives around three goals. First is to be with Jesus. A disciple of Jesus will do whatever they have to do to be present with Jesus. Next, they will do whatever they have to do to become more like Jesus, to, to see what he does and, and, and to become more like him. And then third, a disciple will reorient their lives around the purpose of doing what Jesus would do if he were me. And it's important that we know that we, what he would do if he were me today. We don't think, oh, I need to live like Jesus, like a, like, you know, a Jewish man from Israel 2,000 years ago. No, if Jesus were you living in Los Angeles or wherever you're living in 2020, what would Jesus do if he were me? This is all what we're all about, being disciples who give everything we can to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Here's the problem. Hurry seeks to distract us from all three of those goals. Hurry is always at the doorstep waiting to interrupt uh, uh, the, the purpose of a disciple, of being with Jesus, of becoming like Jesus and doing what he does. And you guys know this is true. For those who are super busy, you never have time. You never find the time to read your Bible. You never find the time to serve somebody in a way that Jesus would. You never find the time to read the book that you need to read to help you get over the next step of whatever the hindrance is, the thing that's stopping you. Hurry will always try to uh, interfere. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has overcome the world, including overcome hurry. John Mark Comer in his book says this, love, joy, and peace uh, are at the heart of all that Jesus is trying to grow in the soil of your life. And all three are incompatible with hurry. And you probably know this is true. Think back to a time in your life when you were extremely hurried and rushed and stressed? Did you have much love you were expressing to those around you? Did you have much joy coming from your life? Were you at peace? Of course not. Carl Jung, the psychologist once said, hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. And while I don't think that's literally true, I think hurry is one of the enemy's great tactics to distract us from, from the purpose and the goal that we have of being disciples, committed to being with Jesus, abiding with him, becoming like Jesus, being transformed by him, and doing what he would do if he were us. The devil wants to do that. So a key to following Jesus, a key to being a disciple, is to recognize any aspect of your life that hinders you from your main objectives of discipleship. And then here's what's important, and then to do something about it. Here's the truth. If you're hurried, you can change how hurried you are. You have the ability to do that. How? I preached on this, this message. I preached on this verse this last weekend. Jesus says this, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you heard the teaching this weekend, you'll remember that when Jesus says, when he's talking about a yoke, he's not just talking about the agricultural tool. He's talking about his teachings, his lifestyle, everything he modeled. He says, you take on my life onto your life and watch the rest that you find. Watch the way that hurry is no longer dominating your life. So how do we do it? What's the secret of an easy yoke? First of all, the secret is not more time. 
so often we think if I just had more time, but you know, like I do, if we had 10 more hours a day, it would get filled with 10 more hours worth of stuff, more stuff, more classes, more programs to watch, more hobbies to pick up, more stuff to take on. Instead, the secret to the easy yoke is learning to take on the teachings and lifestyle of Jesus and then discovering how to apply them to your life today. And the question is, how do I live like Jesus would if he lived in 2020? If he were in Los Angeles, in quarantine, in social isolation, only operating off of Zoom, what would he do? If Jesus had three small children in his home like I do, what would he do? And ultimately, this is where we're talking about the spiritual disciplines and the practices of Jesus. Some examples of these might be, and this is an exhaustive, meditation is a practice of Jesus that, that you can take on. Prayer, fasting, silence, study, etc. cetera. Uh, there's a few listed in the book, and I think we have a poll for these, Marvin, right, to kind of see, uh, to ask the question of what spiritual disciplines would, would you guys be most interested in taking on right now? Can we see that poll? Should be up now. Yeah, so what is one practice of Jesus that you would love to do if you had more time? One is silence and solitude, taking time to be quiet, not distracted, uh, to pray and be quiet. Sabbath, taking a full day to rest, no work, um, no, you know, no, 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 no work of any kind, just simply resting. Simplicity is the practice of ridding your life of clutter and things that lead you to being more hurried and then slowing the spiritual discipline of slowing every part of your life down. I talked about this. Uh, when I practice slowing, I drive the speed limit and I always pick the longest line in the grocery store. And it is a spiritual discipline for me. That is tough. You could also uh, 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 do other if you want to specify a different one, but we'll give this a few more seconds here. What's a practice of Jesus that you would take on if you had more time? All right. Yeah, it looks like simplicity. That's great. That's my wife and I are in this process right now. We're like, we looked at each other. We're like, we have got to purge. We've got to get rid of all of this stuff because physical clutter in your house will result in a hurried soul and hurry in your life. So that's great. I just want to encourage you, whichever one you selected, you actually can do that. You can begin practicing this now. So I really want to encourage you guys to do that. Um, all right, let me get this poll back off my screen. Sorry about that. So um, ultimately, though, it's not just about taking on new disciplines, but it's creating a new way to live. And it's something called creating a rule of life. And some of you maybe love this, your personality type. Maybe you already do something like this. Others of you, more of the you know, the, the P on the Meyer Briggs, the more freewheeling, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, people who love to just, you know, do things in a moment's notice. This may be a little bit tougher for some of you, but creating a rule of life is something that is so important for taking on the yoke and the practices of Jesus. And I'm just going to describe what this is. I'm going to share with you my rule of life, and then we'll be done here in just a moment. A rule of life is a schedule in a set of practices that you decide to order your life around the way of Jesus. So it's you pre, and many of you will do this with work or something else, but you predetermine, you preset your schedule and your practices with following Jesus and living the way of Jesus in the center of it and everything else revolves around it. Rule the word, uh, from the word uh, regula in Latin, which means a straight piece of wood. And you can think of a ruler when you think of this, or another great way to think about it, think trellis, right? Um, the last, I don't know if any of you ever been to a vineyard before, but you, you'll find the grape vines right out, out in the vineyard with the grapes growing to be eventually made to wine. And under every healthy grapevine, you will always find a trellis, a piece of wood to create scaffolding for a healthy vine to grow on 
and to have support and structure. It's a structure to hold up a vine so it can grow and bear fruit. Listen, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and you will produce much fruit. A rule of life is a scaffolding based on Jesus's life that we build into our own to allow us to bear the healthy fruit of an unhurried life uh, that he wants us to do. Here's what we have to know. I think that our, in the church today, we've in some ways gone so far away from the law and rules and regulation to this other extreme of liberty. But listen, following Jesus is something that you do. Either you do it or you don't do it. It's as much practice as faith. Sometimes we think the following Jesus is just simply like, oh yeah, man, I believe in Jesus and I believe in grace and that's it. Well, grace is certainly key and it's a part of it. But to really follow Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus means that you put things in your life, practices that you saw in Jesus that you now are ready to put in your life. And so how do you know? What should the rule of life that you create be for yourself? Well, let's start here. Jesus in Matthew 6. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. Jesus has put my kingdom and my righteousness in the center of your rule of life and work, family, health, recreation, all of that will come along. But you put my kingdom first. A rule of life, it allows you to establish your priorities and, and your values before the hurry of the day has its way with you. And you guys know like I do, man, hurry has a way. So my encouragement to you, my challenge to you after this, create your rule of life with the kingdom of God in the center of it. Create your rule of life with the practices and habits of Jesus in the center of it that you want you and your family to live and to practice. Let me share mine with you very quickly and then we'll take some questions. An example of my rule of life. And listen, a big part of this will have to do with your life, what the hurry in your life is. For me, I, maybe it's generational, I don't know, but you, you'll notice a ton of mine is about my phone. Because about six months ago, I discovered my phone is a problem. I am addicted to this thing. I cannot get away from it. And it was causing me to be so hurried and distracted. So what are the rules that I came up with to help me follow Jesus better and to rid my life of hurry. Here's a couple of them. Some of these may seem ridiculous to you, but they have been very important to me. Number one, my phone sleeps in the kitchen. I don't know about you, but my phone was sleeping on my nightstand and I would, it would be the last thing I look at before I go to sleep. And I would wake up in the morning before I got out of bed, I would have it in my hand, six inches from my face, looking at it again. And I got sick of my phone being the first, the last word of the day and the first word of the day. So I got rid of it. So my phone, I got a little basket in my kitchen with a plug. Before I go to bed, I plug it in. I leave it in my kitchen. I, I bought this crazy ancient device called an alarm clock. And it wakes me up when, it, when I need to wake up. And now I don't sleep with my phone next to me. And I feel so free by that. The next rule for me is I wake up before my kids do. They wake up early, so I wake up earlier. Uh, almost always because I can't have a quiet time if they're awake. So I do the hard work sometimes 5 15, 5 30. I'm out of bed so I can be awake before my kids wake up. For my wife and I, we do not engage with our phones in any capacity until we spent time reading the Bible and talking to each other. I want God's word to be the first word in my day, not the news, a Twitter. What did Trump tweet? What's going on with COVID-19? Can you believe what that celebrity did? I don't want that to be the first thing I hear. So instead, I, I read my Bible and talk to my wife before I ever touch my phone. When I was going to the gym, gym and exercise happens after time in the Bible. I was waking up super early, going to the gym, and then coming home, being like, I can't have time to read my Bible. My kids are awake. It's so loud. And I realized the gym was more important to me than time in God's word, so I flipped them. So now the gym won't happen until after uh, the Bible. For our family, all meals are eaten at the dinner table with no phones and no TV at all. We do not have the TV on, and we don't even bring our phones to the dinner table. We keep them separate because I want my fam, my kids' memories to be we had dinner together and we talked to each other. So we eat dinner at the table. We don't eat on the couch or anywhere else. We always eat all at the table with no TV and no phones present. 
this next one might be a little sensitive and here's what you need to know. This is my family's choice and not, not an indictment on anybody else. Oh wait, well, no TVs in the bedroom. Hold on, I'll save that last thought. No TVs in the bedroom. We, there's just other stuff I'd rather do and you can make the sex joke or sleep, whatever. Like there's so much better stuff than watching TV. So we don't have any TVs in our bedroom because we don't want to be distracted by uh, TV and that we have one TV in the house. My kids do not have their own devices. Now they're four, three, and one. As they get older, that may happen, but they don't have their own iPads. They don't have access to our phones. We don't let our kids play with phones because we want them to have other experiences in this age other than devices. I think there's enough screen time coming for them. And so we've made the choice not to let our kids use our phones for games or anything else like that. As they get older, as they leave the house, as they need to get hold of them, that will change certainly. But for us, for our little kids, we don't give them their own devices. We resist the temptation to make excuses on the Sabbath. I preached about what I do on Sabbath this weekend, but what, what I know is it's easy to be tempted to excuse things into our schedule. We resist that temptation. A couple more, and I talked about these uh, this weekend. I drive the speed limit as much as I can, and it puts me to death spiritually sometimes. Uh, it's just so, it's such a hard temptation, but it slows me down spiritually when I slow down physically. I intentionally choose the longest line in the grocery store, and that is hard to do, but it's a spiritual practice for me. And finally, I try really hard to not pull out my phone every time I have a down moment. It's so easy every time you stop to just pull out your phone and distract yourself. So this is my rule of life. My question for you is what could your rule of life look like to help you set your rules, to write them down, decide on them as a family, to help build in a rule of life uh, to help you follow Jesus. Here's the last thing I want to say. Hurry still happens. It still creeps in. And when it does, here's what I tell myself. And I got this from John Mark Homer from the book. I say, slow down, breathe, come back to the moment. Jesus is with me in this moment. He wants to speak something to me and I make myself available to hear from the Lord. So hope that was helpful for you guys. <clears throat> Rule of life is not necessarily super easy to create, but it's super important and valuable. So um, thanks for hearing me out on that. Thank you so much, Bo. That was really good. I appreciated all of your um, personal and practical tips. Uh, I'm still enjoying the fully, was it fully here Fridays that you guys Fully did? here Friday. With the chocolate yeah. chip pancakes, man. That was such a, such a sweet Sabbath thing. Sabbath breakfast, man. It's the best yes, meal of the week. Yes, yes. Uh, a couple of really good questions came through on the chat and guys feel free to unmute yourself if you want to chime in. Uh, but Michael, I don't know if that's Mike Williams, but just said Michael on my chat. Uh, he had a question about uh, carving out time. Mike, is that you? Would you ask your question? It was me. Oh, great. Thanks, Michael. It was me, Marvin. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, Bo, if you or anybody of the guys out here, any tips of how to carve out that important time? Um, you know, we, we all get things, you know, uh, work, family, other responsibilities, just asking for it. So how do you kind of put that first, right? You know? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and and it, it's so hard. You're right. Work, family, it's like we have every excuse and they're valid. They're real, but right. so is our need. Um, so is our need to make this time. And so, so I, I would probably start with having an honest look at your life. And, if, you know, if you've got married or you got kids, they can help speak into it identifying what are the big hurry points and distractions that we have in our lives? What is robbing us from the sense of uh, being present and peaceful? So I would identify, because then you can start to troubleshoot mm. it if you can identify that. The other things that, that, that I would suggest are, you know, the, what we see in Mark from Jesus is it says in Mark 1 that Jesus got up very early while it was still dark to go and pray. And so my yeah. best quiet times happen before the sun comes up. And that means I get up super early. To be able to do that, that means I go to bed super early. So like 9, 9, 15, some nights I'm getting into bed and it feels early. I have to say right. no to watching more shows and, and, and um, you know, watching the movies I may want to watch. But I know I got to get to bed early because I got to get up early because if I don't do that quiet time first thing in the morning, it won't happen. So I would say early is better for me. Identify what the big distractions are in your family and in your life and then do something about it. An example for me. Years ago, I discovered for lots of reasons that my smartphone was a problem um, because of hurry, because of lust and temptation, all of these other issues were going on. So I went to AT&T and I bought the $25 flip phone. And for six months, I was on a flip phone. 
uh, and I walked in, I was like, hey, I need to change my iPhone to this phone. The lady at at and was like, why? And I was like, don't worry about it. I'm trying to follow Jesus over here. So I made a drastic change. And for six months, I was away from a smartphone. So identify the problem and then um, get drastic if you have to. Listen, there's nothing more important. Like I said, as a disciple, nothing more important and being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus and doing what he did. And so we need to be willing to change everything. So, you know, Michael, I don't know what the specific struggles for you and your family would be in this, but um, for me, earlier is always better. And then get ruthless, like the title says, get ruthless with what you need to do to get the hurry out to create that quiet time. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. That's really good. Yeah, thanks thanks for, for the question. question. Thanks for the question, Michael. Um, I've got a, uh, I've got your email address. So I've got a uh, Amazon gift card coming your way so that you can buy the book. Hopefully there's some good tips in that book that'll help you out. Uh, one more question. Orlando has a question about um, the difference between some of the different spiritual practices or rhythms. Orlando, you want to ask your Great. question? Great. Uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the thing is that uh, I was, uh, we were seeing this in the live, live uh, group as well, mm -hmm. but it wasn't that clear to me that what are, for example, the differences between meditation, praying, and solitude with God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And and I think all of those practices can be really, they're really connected to each other. Um, I think that oftentimes you need to do one to do the other. But so, you know, solitude is the practice of going and getting away, getting quiet, away from distraction, and getting away from noise while you're practicing solitude, you can certainly pray, which I, I would say prayer. First of all, we need to be able to listen and pray, but prayer is a real engaging and oftentimes conversation that takes place with God. It's where you're offering things to God. You're, and then you certainly want to be quiet and practice listening and prayer, but you know, prayer is engaging. I would say meditation is picking a thought or a scripture, a thought of God or a scripture and really focusing in on that. So when I'm meditating on scripture, I will pick a scripture, second Corinthians, where Paul says that God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. And I'm going to meditate on that. I will practice solitude, go to a quiet place. I will pray and say, God, would you speak to me in this time? And then I will meditate and I will focus on the words, my grace is sufficient for you. And I will just sit with that same phrase and roll it over and just kind of meditate and make that the center focus um, of my thoughts. So to meditate, I feel like it's to really like hone your focus down. Other religions, other practices will, will certainly do it differently. Meditation is more like emptying your mind of all things. For me as a follower of Jesus, what I see in scripture to meditate is to focus your attention on Christ. So I don't know if that helps, but I would say solitude is getting quiet and getting away. Prayer is engaging oftentimes with God and meditating is picking a thought or a word from God and focusing and remaining on that thought. Does that help? Yes. Would you say you can do the three things in, in yeah. session or yeah. something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you can do them oftentimes either together or within the same period. If I'm going and getting some quiet time, if I'm going to practice solitude, it's hard for me to do. So I'm going to take advantage of that. I mean, I'm going to pray. I am going to meditate. You know, I'm going to practice multiple of the disciplines if I can. So. Thanks for the question. That's great. Really good question, Orlando. Thank you. Um, I know there's a couple other questions, but we're going to, we're going to cut it off there. If you want to uh, connect with Bo directly, Bo, how can they get a hold of you? Or, or Yeah. So um, my email and what I'll do is I will drop it right here. Bo at cachurch.com. Um, that's my email address. You can um, email me. Sorry. You know what I'm doing right now is I'm say I'm, exporting my presentation to PDF and I'm going to put it in here right now. I'll see if I can do that. Um, so everybody can have a copy of the 